This month, the interstellar object 3i Atlas, only the third object of its kind ever discovered, is becoming easier to spot from Earth. Since its discovery in July, it's revealed chemistry unlike any comet we've ever studied, rich in carbon dioxide, with metals behaving in unexpected ways, and traces of water that defy how we thought comets release it. At the end of October, it made its closest pass by the Sun, a period when it was nearly impossible to see from Earth, but perfect for spacecraft to study its tail and watch how sunlight vaporized material from its surface. Now, as it moves closer to Earth, those observations are helping scientists uncover how interstellar comets truly differ from our own, and what that reveals about the chemistry and physics of other star systems in the galaxy. And if it follows predictions, November could be one of the best months yet to observe it and even photograph another object from a different star system. But it isn't the only thing worth talking about this month. We'll check in on Comet A6 Lemon and Comet R2 Swan, talk about Jupiter's retrograde, why Uranus is at its best, and a few meteor showers you won't want to miss. I'm Sarah Matthews, and as always, grab a snack because we're going to be talking about 3i Atlas, arguably the most interesting object in our night sky right now, and November really is a great turning point for 3i Atlas for us Earthlings. At the end of October, it made its closest pass by the sun, and that burst of heat is now releasing gas and dust, likely brightening its coma and tail. As it moves closer to Earth, the viewing geometry keeps improving through November and December, giving us a clearer view each week. Now, when 3i Atlas was officially confirmed to exist in July by the Atlas Survey Telescope in Chile, astronomers immediately knew something was different. It was racing at 58 kilometers per second, the fastest comet ever recorded, and it was traveling on a hyperbolic orbit, meaning it isn't gravitationally bound to the sun. It's just passing through once and vanishing back into interstellar space. Almost more unusual is the angle that it arrived in almost perfectly aligned with the ecliptic plane, the flat disk where most planets orbit the sun around. That alignment explains why its path carries it past Mars, Venus, Earth, and Jupiter on its very brief stint through the inner solar system. Now, once 3i Alice was confirmed to actually exist, as well as be an interstellar object, ground-based telescopes and space-based telescopes turned to observe it. The Hubble Space Telescope revealed a nucleus about 5.6 kilometers wide. This is larger than any interstellar object seen before, and already releasing gas when it was 3.8 astronomical units from the Sun, which is surprisingly active for that distance. Now, NASA's Swift Observatory, which is an observatory out in space, had been observing 3i Atlas since July, when it was still about 3 astronomical units from the Sun. In a study recently published, Swift detected hydroxyl gas. These are the fragments created when sunlight breaks apart water molecules, revealing that 3i Alice was losing water at a distance where water ice normally stays frozen. Now, the best explanation we have so far is that ice-coated dust grains carried that water outward and released it as they warmed, roughly about 40 kilograms per second, so that's a lot of water. Then came the breakthroughs with the James Webb Space Telescope. In August, JWST measured a carbon dioxide to water ratio of 7.6 to 1. While comets in our solar system are mostly water ice, this one is dominated by CO2, suggesting it formed in an extremely cold region near the carbon dioxide frost line of its original star system before being ejected into, well, interstellar space. And then there were metals discovered. When astronomers used the Very Large Telescope in Chile to study 3i Atlas between August and September, they detected strong nickel emissions, but no iron at all. That was immediately puzzling, because nickel and iron are very commonly found in comets, and they usually appear in very similar amounts together. But only later, as the comet moved closer to the sun, about 2.6 astronomical units away, did iron start to finally be seen. And when it did, the nickel to iron ratio dropped dramatically. Our best explanation so far is that these metals aren't being released in pure elemental form. They're bound in organic compounds, specifically nickel tetracarbonyl and iron pentacarbonyl. Nickel tetracarbonyl vaporizes at lower temperatures, so it would make sense that it appeared first. But iron pentacarbonyl needs more heat, and it appearing later as a comet approaches the sun makes a lot of sense. So if that's true, well, 3i Atlas may have just confirmed a long-standing theory about how metals escape from comet surfaces, even those within our own solar system. Now, during its journey inwards, 3i Atlas passed 30 million kilometers from Mars on October 3rd, where ESA's ExoMars Trace Gas Orbiter captured the comet's coma as a faint moving dot. 
Meanwhile, ESA's JUICE spacecraft, or in other words, Jupiter Icy Moons Explorer, is observing 3i Atlas between November 2nd and the 25th, just after perihelion, which is when the comet is supposed to be the most active, or basically when it's closest to the sun. Around the same time, NASA's Europa Clipper, now en route to Jupiter, was expected to cross part of the comet's ion tail between October 30th and November 6th. Its plasma instruments and magnetometer could detect charged particles or magnetic field charges, potentially the first direct sampling of material ions on an interstellar comet. But it could show us how an interstellar comet interacts with solar wind and sunlight in ways that we've never observed before. 3i Atlas will continue outward, passing Venus on November 3rd, Earth on December 19th, and Jupiter a few months later, before it disappears into the dark abyss of interstellar space for good. And as November progresses, 3i Atlas will climb higher in the morning sky, becoming a lot easier for us to see from Earth. Now, at its brightest, it's predicted to reach a magnitude 10 or 11, which is by no means going to be naked eye visible, but if you have a 6 inch to 8 inch telescope and you're under dark skies, then you may very well be able to see it. If you're planning to observe or photograph it, I do recommend using a planetarium app like Solarium or Night Sky Safari, where you can just plug in 3i Atlas and it'll show you where in the sky it is currently for your location and time. And if you still can't see it, then I recommend using a long exposure image on your mobile device mobile devices camera and just point it in that direction and take that long exposure and you should be able to see it so that way you can line up your telescope or your lens and camera and really get it framed up just the way that you want it. Starting around mid-November, look east to southeast about 90 minutes before sunrise. You'll find it low near Spica in Virgo, it's a very large bright star, then gradually rising toward Leo by month's end. For dedicated astrophotographers, short stack exposures of 20 to 30 seconds on a tracking mount will bring out more detail, including hints of its developing tail. Of course, if you don't have a tracking mount, then just use the 500 to 300 rule for your exact setup. But remember kids, comets are notoriously unpredictable. They might fade, they might flare up, they might get super bright. This all just depends on so many factors that we have absolutely no control over. They are like cats. So you just kind of have to let them be and just appreciate them for what they are. Now, 3i Atlas isn't the only comet worth talking about this month. Comets A6 Lemon and R2 Swan have been putting on a show for the last month or two, with one in particular becoming brighter than expected. So let's take a look, shall we? First up, Comet R2 Swan, a brief visitor that lit up the northwestern skies in October. It made its closest approach to Earth on October 20th, shining around a magnitude 6, just below naked eye visibility. Its tail was striking back in late September, like you see in this image, but it has since faded, but it now just shows a small greenish coma. It's still pretty cool, it's still pretty cute, where we have this soft glow that's coming from the diatomic carbons fluorescing in sunlight. Through November, Swan lingers after sunset, climbing slightly higher each evening and drifting past Saturn around mid-month. And then on November 3rd, it does cross the celestial equator northward, starting its long journey back towards the outer solar system. So as Swan gracefully flies away, as swans do, let's talk about A6 Lemon. Comet A6 Lemon became the star of October, even though it is a comet. Yes, I realize that doesn't make sense. It brightened to about a magnitude 4 or about a magnitude 5, briefly visible to the naked eye under very dark skies, and pretty easy through binoculars. It did display these two distinct tails, which is really cool. We have a curved dust tail, which is made of sun-pushed grains from vaporizing ice, and then we have this straighter gas tail, or sometimes called an ion tail, which is glowing in ultraviolet light from excited carbon compounds. Now, as November begins, Lemon is still visible from the Northern Hemisphere, though it is fading pretty quickly. You're gonna wanna look low above the Western horizon about 90 minutes after sunset. By November 10th, its maximum altitude will be only 16 to 19 degrees depending on your latitude. It'll be higher for the Southern US, lower for Canada or Northern Europe. It does reach its closest approach to the sun on November 8th at about 0.53 astronomical units from the sun, after which it will dim pretty rapidly. Now, this month brings a lot of motion with regard to the planets. Jupiter has entered retrograde motion, and it's appearing to move backward against the background stars after its conjunction with the moon. Of course, Jupiter isn't actually reversing in its motion because that would be pretty wild. It's actually an optical effect caused by Earth overtaking Jupiter in its orbit. 
Now Saturn, the other gas giant of our beloved solar system, has just ended its retrograde motion. And then by month's end, Saturn pairs with the moon once more, making it a beautiful lunar conjunction to close out November. Now farther out, Uranus is at its best. Yeah, not that Uranus, because it's always at its best. Uranus reaches opposition, meaning it is opposite of the sun in our sky, and it's shining its brightest of the year. It'll appear as a small turquoise disk in the constellation Aries, which will be visible most of the night through binoculars or a telescope. Now let's talk about the moon, because this month's full moon is called the full beaver moon, and it also happens to be a super moon, which means it'll appear slightly larger and slightly brighter because it is at its closest approach to Earth in its orbit around Earth, or what is called perigee. Then just two weeks later, we have a new moon, which is the best time to really see anything because we don't have the bright moon obstructing things, even though it is pretty. And that's really good for meteor showers that we're going to be talking about. So the first one is the Taurus meteor shower. There is the North Taurus meteor shower and the South Taurus meteor shower. The radiant is in the constellation Taurus in just slightly different areas, but they will be peaking at slightly different times as well. Now the meteors for the Taurids aren't going to be very crazy, there's not going to be like tons of them going on, but they are known for being very very bright and very large, so you get what are called fireballs. You can expect about 5 to 10 meteors per hour in very dark skies, with the conditions being the best when the radiant points are at the highest point that they can get. Now that doesn't mean you have to only look in that direction, it just means that if you were to stack an image with all of the meteors over the course of a night, that it would appear to radiate from those two points. And then later in the month, we have a beautiful meteor shower called the Leonids, which is associated with the constellation Leo. And the peak of this meteor shower is going to be near the new moon, which is great because that means you're going to be able to see more meteors. You can expect to see anywhere between 10 to 15 meteors per hour. And while this year won't bring a storm, the Leonids are famous for some of the most dramatic outbursts in history, where you have moments when thousands once streaked across the sky. But that's not going to happen this year. But that is really cool still. Now let's talk about the Milky Way and the best constellations this month. For Northern observers, the Milky Way core season has sadly ended, but the Great Rift, which is this really cool dark dust lane running through the Milky Way, still stretches beautifully across the western horizon after dusk. And then as night deepens, the focus is going to be shifting eastward. You do have the constellations Perseus, Auriga, and Taurus that are rising earlier, and they are climbing higher each night. They are going to be bringing some of the coolest, most intricate nebulae, clusters, and galaxies. Now later on in the evening, the constellations Orion and Gemini begin to rise, signaling the approach of the bright winter constellations that we'll explore more in December. Now speaking of the Southern Hemisphere, even though I was not Speaking about the Southern Hemisphere, let's talk about the constellations and the Milky Way for the Southern Hemisphere. Just like in the Northern Hemisphere, the Milky Way's core is drifting much sooner into the night, into the horizon, which is kind of sad, but again, we do have the Great Rift that you can see. Farther south, you have the faint Gum Nebula regions, and they shimmer near the Vela Carina boundary, tracing the edge of our galaxy's next spiral arm. So there's lots to see this month. What are you planning to observe or photograph? Let me know down in the comments because I'm really curious, as well as anybody who's going to take a stab at trying to find 3 Eye Atlas. And if you would like to support this channel, please consider, you know, becoming a patron over on my Patreon for exclusive content. So until the next video, I hope you all have clear skies. Thanks everyone.